four-game series between the Florida Marlins and the Colorado Rockies. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kenny Albert, along with Jeff Torborg. Outstanding start for both clubs. Marlins second place in the East, Rockies second place in the West, although this stadium has not been kind to the Colorado Rockies. They have lost 10 in a row here in Miami, but this season, outstanding offensive numbers by the Rockies. The Rockies have an offensive alignment that is awesome. When you realize the categories you can lead in offensively in the league, they lead in almost all of them. They do so much right. Larry Walker, of course, is leading this ball club right now, leading the National League in hitting, second in home runs, third in RBIs, but check this stat out. Four of their lineup combined have more home runs than 12 other National League teams. And if you think that's just because of Coors Field, that's not true. Larry Walker has hit 11 of his 14 home runs on the road. Now, as you know, Jeff, from your days as a Major League Manager, good pitching should be good hitting. Well, it should, and I think when you have a pitcher on the mound like Alex Fernandez tonight, tremendous athlete, the biggest acquisition over the wintertime, he is a winner, four good pitches, tremendous hitter, the opposition in the league's only hitting 218 against him, he is an outstanding winning pitcher. And his mound opponent tonight for the Colorado Rockies, 25-year-old Bobby Jones, making his third Major League start. It's the Rockies and the Marlins from Miami, coming up next. This is Fox Sports Net. Fox Sports Net Baseball Thursday, brought to you by the Learning Channel. Adventures for your mind. Welcome back to Miami, where Don Baylor's Colorado Rockies have lost 10 consecutive games, including all seven last year. They've scored only 16 runs in those seven games, and Baylor will send this lineup to the plate tonight against Alex Fernandez, Eric Young, the leadoff hitter, the second baseman, followed by center fielder Ellis Burks, Larry Walker in right, Andres Calaraga, the first baseman, left fielder Dante Bichette, third baseman Vinny Castilla, the catcher. Kurt Manwaring, shortstop, the former Marlon Walt Weiss, and the Rockies pitcher tonight, Bobby Jones. 27-year-old Alex Fernandez with a record of 5-5 five and five in his first National League season, and Eric Young takes ball one. Alex Fernandez is an outstanding talent, 90-plus mile an hour fastball, good curveball, good slider, good change. Strike one called by the home plate umpire, Randy Marsh. Just watch the ball from this shot here, how that ball jumps at the plate. Alex has a live arm and can pitch both sides of the plate very effectively. Here's the 1-1, one -one and Young lifts it in the infield. The second baseman, Kyle Abbott, calling for it. One away in the top of the first. Alex Fernandez, as we talked about, is a local kid, and here are his numbers for this year. 5-5, five and 2.91 five, ERA. In nine of his ten starts, he's gone three innings. Uh, he has gone six innings, only given up three runs in all of those innings, no more. And this guy is a real competitor, a very emotional pitcher. I had him when I managed the White Sox. Young pitcher with a very aggressive arm. Ellis Burks takes strike one from Fernandez. Burks did not start the Rockies' last game on Tuesday due to a groin strain. He did pinch hit later on. Second in the National League with 12 home runs. And the 0-1, I wanted one. Now, as you watch Alex Fernandez, you look at him, very stockily built, 6'1", 235. The White Sox did stats on him last year and found out that when he was above 235, he was more effective. You would think as a, as a season went along, he'd lose weight. He gained weight and got more effective. And Burks lifts this one in the air to center field. John Cangelosi makes the catch two away here in the first. And as you see Cangelosi reel that in, John Cangelosi, of course, playing center field in this defense. Charles Johnson behind the plate, two-time goal glover. Man, this guy is good. And you talk about a team being strong up the middle defensively. Edgar Renneria is another one of those young geniuses that, with a glove in his hand, it's shortstop. Kurt Abbott playing second, former shortstop. Gary Sheffield back in the lineup tonight at right field. And of course, you got Moises Alou in left and John Cangelosi in center. What a start to the season for Larry Walker, who takes ball one. The National League Player of the Month for the month of April. Walker working on a 15-game hitting streak. And 
as Fernandez falls behind 2-0. Well, you can see what Alex is trying to do. He's trying to pitch Larry Walker inside. That's always been the book on him. Pitch him hard in. He has an open stance and heads back toward the plate. You don't want to get his, let him get his arms extended. And a 2-0. Walker fouls it off down the left field line. Now, right after saying that, they tried to pitch him away. And the reason being, and Larry Walker's going back to get a new bat and put a new handle in one, when you get behind in the count, it's very difficult to pitch inside because you always teach your pitchers, when you're pitching inside, if you're going to miss, miss farther in. Well, that doesn't help when you're down two balls and no strikes, so you've got to try to go back out over the plate. And as you saw, Larry Walker just threw the head of the bat at that, even though the, the bat broke and he hit a shot down a left field line, and he's that kind of hitter. And we were talking about Alex Fernandez. We're talking about a guy who pitches with extreme emotion. His college coach, Charlie Green, down at Dade South Community College, told me one time, just say to him, eye of the tiger. That's the way he approaches pitching, comes right at hitters. And he comes right at Larry Walker there. Called strike two. So Fernandez fell behind 2-0. Oh. It's now two balls, two strikes with two outs in the top of the first inning from Miami. Count is now full. <laughs> the numbers against Florida by Larry Walker. Well, there are a lot of clubs I think he can say that against, and he's one of the reasons I'm up in the booth here now. When I was managing the Mets, he killed us. He, this guy is an exceptional talent, not just with a bat in his hand, believe me. And the first Rockies base runner of the game. Fernandez does not walk many batters. So far this season, only two base on balls per nine innings, but on the 3-2 uh, pitch, he walks Larry Walker. So two away, Andres Galarraga will step to the plate against Fernandez. Well, you hate to put any on anyone on base, but if a guy's hitting 409 in the league for the season, you want to be very careful with him. And as we mentioned earlier, he's second in home runs, so you have to be careful with Larry Walker, but you have to be careful with this whole lineup. What a year Galarraga had last year, and he's picking right up where he left off. Of course, last year he led the National League in home runs and RBIs. And when you talk about 47 home runs and 150 RBIs, that's a pretty fair year. So far this season, 49 runs batted in in 50 games. Galarraga leading the league in RBIs per at-bat. Five for nine during the recent series. The split with the St. Louis Cardinals. Both teams were off yesterday. Marlins split two in L.A. earlier this week. As Galarraga fouls it off. Well, it gives you a little idea of the kind of stuff Alex Fernandez has now. When you watch that, and you're looking at Gene Glenn on, on the left, the third base coach, Larry Walker is a base-stealing threat. He's got 11 stolen bases this year. This Colorado club can run. And, of course, Galarraga, you can see both eyes on the pitcher. But it didn't matter. That ball was so hard, he might not have seen that. Alex Fernandez is very aggressive, as we said. I called him before like an aggressive arm. It means that the ball comes out of his hand, just pops. Now watch this pitch. Look at that. It's right down the middle. He just threw the ball by him. That ball just has giddy up right at the end. Fernandez keeping Walker close. We're talking about Alex, and if you think that I don't think a lot of this kid, I've talked nothing but highest praise for him. I believe this guy's got a chance to be a Cy Young winner before his career is over pretty soon, I would think. Walker on the run, but Galarraga swings and misses strike three. That does it for the Rockies in the top of the first. Fernandez now five strikeouts away from 1,000. This is Fox Sports Net. Inning. Jim Leland's Florida Marlins with a record of 30 and 19, second best in the National League behind only the Atlanta Braves. Boom the Marlins trail by four and a half games. Just
Aaron Cangelosi will lead it off for the Marlins. The center fielder followed by the shortstop, Edgar Renteria. The second baseman, Kurt Abbott. Gary Sheffield returning from the disabled list tonight in right field. Boises Alou in left. Bobby Bonilla, the third baseman, Jeff Conine at first. Charles Johnson behind the plate. And in the ninth slot, the pitcher, Alex Fernandez. Kenny, the Rockies defense is very much improved. As you see the layout here, Kurt Marinwaring has been acquired to really do the job that Joe Girardi did before he went to the Yankees. Very good defensive catcher. The outfield, especially Burks and Walker, are very good outfielders. Walt Weiss has been around a long time at shortstop. Very good shortstop. Eric Young, the kid from Rutgers, has made himself an excellent second baseman. Galaragas and Castillo in the corners are underrated, but very good defensive players. Now on the mound, Bobby Mitchell Jones, and I say Bobby Mitchell Jones because it's Bobby M. Jones, the left-hand here and not Bobby Jones from the, the right-hander from the Mets, a Jersey kid, and you can see his numbers, 1-0, and all, earned run average is 6, which is a little elevated, but got a live arm, 93, 94-mile-hour fastball, makes the ball sink, rides it, and he has a slider and a circle changeup. Jones missed pitching against his namesake by one day when the Rockies visited Shea Stadium earlier this month. Ball one to the leadoff hitter for the Marlins, John Cangelosi. The Mets' Bobby Jones won his National League leading ninth game of the season last night. Here's the 1-0, and Jones falls behind 2-0. Cangelosi has seen extensive playing time as of late due to the injuries suffered by both Gary Sheffield, who returns tonight, and Devon White. Cangelosi with a hit in all 10 of his starts this season as he takes strike one. Cangelosi's a real good man to have in a ball club. When Jimmy Leland came over as a new manager of the Marlins, one of the first things he did was ask Dave Dombrowski to start building the bench, and there's Jimmy in the dugout. You need a good bench to win. And so what they did, they're checking to see if there was a swing, and no, they say. But Cangelosi is a switch hitter. He runs well. He's a good defensive outfielder, and he had played for Jim Leland with Pittsburgh. And they went out and got also Jim Eisenreich from the Phillies, good hitter, still runs well. So it, strong benches make for good teams. The 3-1 gets away, ball four, so the leadoff man is on for the Marlins in the first. Well, this is what you worry about when you start a young pitcher. Uh, especially, it doesn't matter where it is, on the road or at home, but especially on the road, you worry about his nerves. Unless you really know what kind of kid he is, a hard-nosed kid, I don't care whether you're a veteran or an old-timer, when you really want to do well, the adrenaline starts flowing, and sometimes early in the game, you can be a little wild. Edgar Renteria steps to the plate. Renteria working on a 12-game hitting streak, squares to bunt, and takes ball one. Kenny, John Cangelosi can steal bases. He's a good base stealer. He's a smart runner, but I don't think they'll see him running right away with young Bobby M. Jones because he's got a terrific move. When he brings his leg up under his shoulder, a lot of the runners start heading back to first base. 1-0, Renteria fouls it off. And when you see him bring his right leg up, left-handers bring the right leg up, he kind of tucks his rear end and leg up under him. And now you see the signs being given by Rich Donnelly, the third base coach. John Cangelosi turns over to look to the first base coach just to see, is there anything on? You hate to see that. You hate to see him look over because sometimes that gives it away. But there's another kind of move. Did you see what Bobby Jones did? He stepped off and faked. You can, you can fake the first base if you step off the rubber. And now Jones to the plate. Renteria lays it down, and it rolls foul. Now, there was just a move by Young Jones right there. That's what you call a quick quick step. He did not lift his leg very high. Now, the pitch prior to that, he did. Now, there are a lot of things you teach pitchers in order to keep them close. Now, here's the pitch, and you'll see the bunt. That's a pretty good pitch to bunt. It's kind of like a cutter in the outside part of the plate, and it's easy for a bunter to hook it down the line, but it went foul. But already you can see that Bobby Jones is well-schooled. He knows how to keep runners close. He tucks his, his right leg up under his shoulder at times. He quick pitches, and he also steps off and fakes to first. The one-two pitch, and Renteria lifts it in the air to center. Ellis Burks makes the catch one away as Cangelosi heads back to first base. Well, that was a bullet, and Ellis Burks made that look easy. Ellis Burks has been around a long time, an all-star, beginning with the Red Sox, went over to the White Sox. This guy is a real good player, and of course the year he had last year was incredible. When you look at it, he just fit right in that lineup. I mean, he was at the top of most of the offensive categories in the league. 
has been banged up during his career, but he's a very smooth center fielder. Player of the week last week in the National League. So with one away, and Cangelosi on first, here's the second baseman, Kurt Abbott, as Jones throws back over to first. So Kurt Abbott was the incumbent shortstop here a year ago and was beaten out by young Renteria. Cangelosi on the move. Here's the throw. And the ball rolls into center field. It got away from the second baseman, Eric Young, as Cangelosi moves down to third. Well, remember what we were talking about before, that with all the weapons that Bobby Jones has holding a runner close, that unless they had a read on him, here's what would have happened. They would have run. The problem was they never threw back over after early. Now, here he goes. Look at this break. John Gant, Cangelosi had seen him enough to realize when he was actually going to go to the plate. As it was, I think that throw might have gotten him at second base if it could have been fielded. First stolen base of the season for Cangelosi. And the error charge to the catcher. Kurt Manwaring. So with one out, Cangelosi down at third base. As Jones falls behind 2-0. Kurt Abbott working on a modest five-game hitting streak. Now 3-0. Well, you can check the defense, too. Now, normally you don't see this early in the game. You don't see the infield pulled in. Now, all around the Rockies infield, they're pulled in, especially in the middle. You don't normally see that in the first inning. The 3-0, and Abbott with a line shot to right. The catch is made by Walker as Cangelosi does not beat the tag. He's gunned out at the plate by Larry Walker. Obviously, Jim Leland doesn't agree, and that, we'll watch that when we come back. Larry Walker with a bullet from right field nails Angelosi. Jim Leland not happy about the call by home plate umpire Randy Marsh. Well, we talked about Larry Walker being a great offensive player. He has all the tools. Look at this throw. One hop to the catcher from right field. Catcher blocks the plate off and then tags the runner. Very difficult call because once the catcher blocks the plate off, you think they stop the leg from sliding across the plate. Dante Bichette takes strike one. Larry Walker, we've talked about his credentials offensively. Got to be job done defensively in the bottom of the first as Bichette falls behind 0-2. Can throw. We talk about five tool players. He can do it all. He can run, he can throw, he can hit, hit for power, field. I mean, that was a terrific play. I didn't think he had a chance. He was going away from the plate to the foul line when he made the throw. I also want to tell you something. When you watch a catcher as good as Charles Johnson having trouble catching straight fastballs or so-called straight fastballs from your pitcher, you know that the ball is jumping around. Alex Fernandez has a crackling fastball tonight, and it is shooting all over the place. Of a shot. Now two balls, two strikes. Take us back to 1990. You were managing the Chicago White Sox when Alex Fernandez made his first major league start. Alex Fernandez, All-American, uh, University of Miami, his freshman year in a date south, and this Golden Spikes Award winner came up with us August 2nd. This one hard hit to the center fielder, Angelosi, one away. He came up the same day that Frank Thomas joined us in 1990. We had a club that ended up winning 94 games that year. He won five games that year. He went from the rookie league every step of the way through in short order to join us in August. He only signed in June. I even pitched him the last game of the year against the Red Sox when they were going for the uh, division title. And this guy was so impressive from day one. He just knows how to pitch. He's a great athlete. Wait till you see him hit. Takes ball one from Fernandez. As you can see, that was a slider right there. And now here you see the kind of lineup. Well, every time you look at another name, look at the names that's come walking up to the plate for the Rockies. But as we talked about, when you have exceptional pitching, that's how you stop real good hitting. And at least that's what they say most of the time. There are times it doesn't necessarily work that way. We talked about play 
players who have hit 40 plus home runs in a season as Castilla takes strike one. His name is not one of the first that would come to mind. However, he did put together a terrific 1996 campaign. And he takes a cut at that one, one and two. Well, when you think about, nobody talks a whole lot about Vinny Castillo. You, you know that he's a good player. But last year he had 40 home runs and 113 RBIs. And this year he's picking right up where he left off. The year before he had an exceptional year. Very quietly goes about his job. Good defensive third baseman. Oh, the curve is in there. And that is strikeout number two by Alex Fernandez. Alex is as sharp tonight as I've seen him in a long time. Watch this quick breaker that he throws in the outside part of the plate. Now, that is not a strike. That's about five or six inches outside. But you can see it from the side. What it is is what you call a late breaker, and the hitters can't recognize it. Look at the spin on that ball. Kurt Manwaring takes strike one as Fernandez works his way down the Rockies batting order. Manwaring at 257 three straight and he quickly falls behind 0 and 2. Kenny I called Alex Fernandez after he signed that big contract and we had a long talk and I said Alex whatever you do don't try to pitch up to the money because so many times guys who sign big contracts as free agents think they have to do more than they're capable of doing and Alex says I know Skip I've got to stay within myself. He's a very emotional kid very very caring about his family and his teammates and I was a little afraid that he would get here at home from the area as we mentioned and try to do too much but he has proven that he knows how to control himself and stay within himself this guy is a big time winner here's the one two and wearing held up two and two now his second year in the big leagues after having looked good his first year he did exactly what I was talking about. He overthrew. He walked over 80 hitters that season. He was not sharp. He tried to do too much. He was 18 and 9. Strike three call. One, two, three inning for Fernandez. We're in Miami as we move to the bottom of the second inning. And we want to remind you this week it's the season premiere of the Fox Saturday Baseball Game of the Week. As Mike Piazza powers the Dodgers into St. Louis to battle the Cardinals. Plus other exciting regional action. Coverage begins with In the Zone, one half hour before game time. Followed by all the hard-hitting action. Check local listings for the game and time in your area on Fox. Well, the last time Gary Sheffield returned from the disabled list back in 1995, he hit the first pitch for a home run. He does not do it here. <laughs> you better not try to swing at that one. That was a live fastball, but it almost bounced. Hard grounder to the third baseman, Castilla, across to Galarraga. And Sheffield is retired. Now to end the inning, Alex Fernandez dropped down and threw from the side, and he threw one of the nastiest pitches I ever want to see. Look at this on the outside corner. I know it's foolish of me to say at this time of the game, he's got no hitter type stuff, Kenny. I mean, anything can happen. You can wear out and they can hit you a good pitch, but he has exceptional stuff tonight. Well, neither Fernandez nor Jones has allowed a hit as of yet. Each pitcher has walked one batter. Here's Moises Alou. Batting at 310. And he takes strike one from Bobby Jones. Alou fifth in the National League with 43 runs batted in. In his first year with the Marlins. Since coming over from the Montreal Expos. Low and outside, one and one. Moises Alou is a heck of a player. Of course, uh, with the Expos, he just came alive. He came up through the Pirate Organization. My oldest son, Doug, and he roomed together at Watertown, New York, way back in 1987. And Alou lifts this one foul down the right field line. Played in only two games with Pittsburgh before he was involved in the Zane Smith trade. And 
to the 1990 season. He's a big, strong kid. He doesn't look as big as he really is when you look at him at first. He's 6'3", 195 pounds, and like his father, exceptionally strong hitter. Here's the one, two. He stays alive. You know, you wonder what it would be like to play for your father, how well, that would put some pressure on a player. Felipe Alou, of course, his father was managing him up at well, the Expos, one of the finest men I've ever met, not to mention managers. Of course, he signed, and now a new manager with Jim Leland, but Jimmy certainly appreciates what Alou can do. 96 RBIs last year. Up the middle, first base hit of the game. As Alou singles to center. With one away here at the bottom of the second. talked about it he's another five tool player he can do everything and he was one of the big acquisitions along with Alex Fernandez and now Bobby Benio stepping into the box they brought aboard to give him the big pop that they needed to the line up and of course we mentioned in the opening he has been hitting a lot of home runs but he's been driving the runs in and he's hitting for a high average very dangerous hitter but he has really come on as of late he spent some time with him with the New York Mets. Yes, Bobby came over to the Mets the year I went there, and uh, both of us did not have a real good time there. I didn't last very long. He did, but uh, he's, I think, a better hitter right-hander as he's hitting tonight. He's, he's stronger from the right side. Stops a foul down the third baseline. And before the game, I was asking him about his hitting technique. Now, if you watch him closely, he lifts his front leg like a pitcher would and it's very difficult a lot of hitting coaches don't like somebody to lift their front leg they feel how do you can hit off of one leg but Bobby told us tonight that it's a timing device for him and gets his weight back and he struggled he couldn't do that in the early part of the year last year with Baltimore he's back doing it again and he's hitting very well a one one second consecutive base hit as Bonilla singles to left interesting you're talking about two teams that are very aggressive they're aggressive on the bases but as we've already seen they're also aggressive in the willingness to throw from the outfield so you better be alive if you're a base runner well the Marlins with two base runners Alou on second Bonilla on first for Jeff Conan well here's a guy who's struggling this is one of the few offensive players on the field tonight, for that matter, who's struggling. And Jeff Conan has been the, one of the big thumpers here for the Marlins, but he has been struggling this year. Pitch from Jones is a call strike one. Remember the pinch hit home run he hit in the, in the All-Star game at Texas? Was the MVP of that All-Star game. Also a world-class racquetball player. Mm -hmm. High and tight, one and one his wife is too well, aren't they a doubles uh, partnership and I, I think that they are so good that they're ranked in the internationally I guess all in the family <laughs> Jones falls behind two and one Alou the runner on second Bonilla on first one out bottom of the second inning no score third game this season between the Rockies and the Marlins Rockies won both in Denver. And Conine with a line shot. The left fielder Bichette makes the catch. And again, they try to catch Alou at second. I, I wonder. It looks like Bichette doesn't like Alou. But that's good. That's good aggressive baseball. You know, both on the runner's part, make them throw. And then the outfielders are saying, hey, don't be messing around those bases against me. You know, it's interesting you see Dante smile in the outfield right now, but he's lost uh, like 30 pounds this year rehabbing a bad knee, a, a surgically repaired knee, and he's lost two or three inches around the waist, and, and it has helped him somewhat defensively because he has not been an outstanding defensive outfielder. He has not made an error this year so far. No, he came back and didn't play much during the spring. And one of the problems he had when he first went in the game, he played the first game he played, I think, was an artificial turf. And that's tough on anybody's wheels. And if you haven't been out there in a while, it's very tough to judge balls off of that. Charles Johnson falls behind. No balls. Two strikes. Charles one Johnson. for 12. Excuse me, Jeff. One for 12 during 
Cleveland's five-game road trip. He's not become the hitter in, in the sense of average hitter that they've been looking for, but he's got big-time power. Call strike three. First strikeout for Jones, who gets out of a jam. Two hits, two left. End of two. Jeff Torborg back in Miami as we head to the top of the third inning. And you are looking at Alex Fernandez with probably the best stuff I think I've ever seen him have. Here in the first inning, watch this pitch to Andres Galarraga. He threw that right by him in his powerhouse. Now watch this breaking ball to Vinny Castillo. Strike three, no chance. Now watch this pitch to Manwaring from the side. I mean, he has just thrown three different pitches exceptionally well. He has sharp stuff tonight. Now, of course, you know, it's kind of foolish of anybody to say that somebody has no-hit stuff because right away somebody gets a base hit. And the old, you know, the, in baseball, you never mention that in no-hitters. Well, I caught three of them, and I did because I wanted to make sure that we got things right. But Alex Fernandez has a crackling type of stuff in command tonight that he could just be overpowering most of this game. The only concern, could the heat catch up to him later? But he's a very strong athlete. But boy, oh boy, I'll tell you this, he has good stuff tonight. Well, just over a year ago, as Walt Weiss leads things off for the Rockies in the third, last May, the Marlins' Al Leiter threw the first no-hitter in club history against these Colorado Rockies. Well, I'll tell you, I, I had Al Leiter when I was coaching with the Yankees, and he has the same kind of live fastball that Alex has, but you can hear Alex popping the glove all over the ballpark. Fouls it off his ankle. Walt Weiss, the first player to play for both the Marlins and the Rockies. Spent uh, the Marlins' inaugural season, 1993, here in Miami. In fact, Weiss drove in the first Marlins run, picked up their first extra base hit, and then moved on to Colorado now in his fourth season with the Rockies. Well, Don Baylor loved Walt Weiss. They played together with the Oakland A's. Walt came out of the University of North Carolina. Strikeout number four for Fernandez. Wow. You know, I don't want to belabor the point, but as you can see, those balls are up in the strike zone where a lot of hitters can, you know, see the ball at least and jump on them. This ball is so live. Now remember, now if you watch this pitch, you'll see how quickly it's by Walt Weiss. Walt usually puts the ball in play. This ball is right by him. It's a little difficult to see at this time of night, though. Here's the pitcher, Bobby Jones. One for four at the plate so far this season. Walt Weiss back in the Rockies dugout. And Fernandez falls behind 2-0 oh to the opposing pitcher. Now, earlier in the year, Kenny, Alex went back to Chicago on this time on the other side of town and almost pitched a no-hitter against the Cubs. He falls behind 3-0 and oh to Jones. He went eight and two-thirds. I mean, he was one out away, and the ball hit him. The ball was hit back through the mound, hit him, and bounced away from him and broke up his no-hitter. That was against the Cubs on April 10th. In his second start as a Marlin, and he walks Bobby Jones on four pitches. Well, I don't know. That's just losing a little focus. It wasn't from lack of popping the ball. Of course, there goes the perfect game. Oh, no, it had gone earlier with a walk, but with Alex, he is so emotional that he really has to stay focused because there are times that uh, when you see him pitch, he wants it so badly that he overthrows. Eric Young takes strike one. Young popped out for the second baseman, Abbott, to lead off the game. Like Jeff Torborg, a uh, <laughs> product of Rutgers University in New Jersey. And the Marlins turn to 4-6-3, double play. And that does it for the Rockies in the third. Rockies and the Marlins, scoreless in Miami. We move to the bottom of the third inning. Don't forget next Thursday, Baseball Thursday, on Fox Sports Net, as Frank Thomas and the White Sox take on the Indians, Barry Bonds and the San Francisco Giants meet Eric Karras and the Los Angeles Dodgers. Baseball Thursday next week on the Fox Sports Net. I wonder where those
bubbles will wind up. Yeah, you just wonder. Look at those folks out there sitting there enjoying themselves and enjoying the game. And this is what they're hoping to do down here is to draw more fans. And, and of course, you talk about these two teams coming in together. And one of the problems that you had is the contrasting attendance figures, both in, in Denver, which has been incredible. They have struggled to bring fans in here in Miami. And they hope that uh, with the free agent signings from this past offseason that that would spur on the fans. Of course, the Miami Heat, their season concluded just last night as Alex Fernandez rounds out to the second baseman, Eric Young. So the basketball season here in South Florida is over. The Florida Panthers lost in the first round of the playoffs this year after making it all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals a year ago. Ironically, last year's Stanley Cup, Colorado against Florida. And, of course, uh, the football training camp did not open for another month and a half, so the Marlins will look to seize the opportunity over the next uh, six weeks or so. Well, they've done a lot of things down here trying to meet and greet the fans and a lot Alex Fernandez for an example who just grounded out has is a hometown boy so he's done an awful lot down here from the public relations standpoint here's John Cangelosi who walks in the first inning you know I'm impressed with young uh, Bobby Jones uh, we'll, we'll have to call him Bobby Mitchell Jones he's from New Jersey out of Rutherford Rutherford of course the area where the Giant Stadium is here's the 0-1 that's a Call slider. Right two. That's a slider. He's not afraid to throw that to right-handers a lot. He's done a lot of what we call backdooring the ball, meaning he's throwing the ball from the outside part of the plate over the outside corner to right-handed hitter. It's a very tough pitch. Angelosi steps out. Jones made his major league debut two weeks ago against the New York Mets in front of friends and family. As Cangelosi fouls it back, he went five and a third innings, did not pick up a decision in that one, and then his second start last Friday at Coors Field, he picked up the victory, an 8-7 win over the Astros, despite allowing six runs, 11 hits in six and two thirds, his first major league victory. Well, you know, it's interesting, last year in the minor leagues, he had been a Rule 5 draft guy in 1995, came over this ball club from the Milwaukee Brewers organization, but last year, in 96, he was a pure reliever, never started a game. And he strikes out John Cangelosi. Comes in with the heat, second strikeout for Bobby Jones. And they decided in the wintertime, they sent him to Venezuela, and he was only two and five, but he started 11 games down there, and his earned run average was under three. I guess they saw in this live arm that hey wait a minute let's see if he can do it as a starter because you can see he's got three pitches fastball slider we haven't seen much of the changeup. Edgar Renteria lines the first pitch from Jones into right field for a base hit as Renteria extends his hitting streak to 13 games. Renteria is a good looking player you know we talk about all the great young shortstops that you see in the game over in the American League Derek Jeter Alex Rodriguez up with a mess you've got Ray Ordonez, who's a magician with a glove. This kid is right there with them with a glove. And then you got Mark Guzalanic up with Montreal. Goes unseen and unthought of, but over 300 as a hitter. So we're talking about a lot of good shortstop, but this kid has got talent. Kurt Abbott fouls off the first pitch from Jones. Abbott flied out back in the first, and then Larry Walker threw out John Cangelosi at the plate to end the inning. Kenny, that was an interesting thing. That was a 3-0 and count. And you see, Jimmy Leland, he'll try anything. You never know what he's going to do it. He let Abbott hit 3-0 and in that situation when the runner was there at third base. Outside for ball one. Now, we mentioned that Kurt Abbott had been the incumbent shortstop here. He had 17 home runs at one point. As you see now, we're in a situation where Rich Donnelly just gave a set of signs. You might see something happen. You never know with Jimmy Leland's team. Oh, that's close to a ball. When you have a pitcher do what what was just done by Bobby Jones, he stepped almost toward home plate. You've got to step toward first. I don't think anybody saw that, but they're going to be looking closely. Now, you see the signs now. That's a fastball, and it's supposedly away. Renteria heading toward second. Here's the throw, and he is safe with his eighth stolen base of the season. Well, that was an excellent throw by Kurt Marimaring, but again, Renteria got a good jump. 
So you'll start to go. Watch his steps. Before the foot hits the ground, the ball is delivered. You watch the runner and see how many. So one, two, three, four. Before the ball was delivered, even a great throw didn't get him. And great positioning by Harry Wendelstadt, one of the best umpires this game has ever known at second base. two away and Abbott takes strike two all right we just saw a set of signs before with Kurt Marin where the runner at first base only gave one sign now it was a runner at second he's got to give a sequence of signs see the number he gave now he still wants the ball away that last spot was where he won the location and Abbott throws this one to left center Burks on the run and he could not get to it Ritalia comes in to score. Here comes Abbott around third, heading for the plate. And here's in there. Wow, you don't see that much except in Major League Baseball this year. You've seen a disproportionate number of these. But maybe in this ballpark, one of the few parks you see this happen. Left center field is way out there. As far as you can go, left center score 34 and that bounced back over their heads. But I want you to watch the end of this play when you get to see the catcher. Now, here's the pitch. Boom. Now, here goes the ball to left center field. Ellis Burks on the run. Now, Ellis just reaches and misses this. Now, watch Kurt Abbott flying, but watch the end of this play. Kurt Manwaring tries to decoy him like the play's not coming to him. At the last minute, he tries to get it. Can happen on a play like that if the catcher decoys like there's no runner coming, the runner won't slide, and you can quick make a slap tag, but the throw was a shade late. Fourth home run of the season for Kurt Abbott. And Gary Sheffield throws it foul down the left field line. Is this the year of the inside the park home run? I think it is. Last year was the year of the home run. 500 home runs, more than 500 more home runs last year than the next greatest amount for any year, and that was 19, what, 87 or 86? Well, this is the year of the inside to Parker. Look at Abbott. He's taking a drink, but he really needed oxygen. Two and one game earlier this week. No balls, two strikes. Count on Gary Sheffield. And we were talking before about Abbott. He had 17 home runs in 95 and then lost his starting job last year. A lot of people said, well, he didn't have the range of shortstop that Renneria has. Well, who does? So what they've done is move him to second. One and two. And they have another outstanding young second baseman in Castillo who, before he got hurt, was second in the league in stolen bases. So he gave, in the middle, good range and good speed. But Kurt Abbott, with the power at second base, a lot like Jeff Kent has been doing for the Giants, Sheffield lifts it in to left center. Off the wall. And Sheffield is in with a stand-up double. Uh, we get a shot of this swing again. I want you to watch how he just reaches out and hits it with one hand. He releases with his top hand. Watch this. Look at that. That's how strong he is. Watch this. Wham! One hand. That's what you call good follow-through and release. something as a hitter as Frank Funk goes out to the mound and Frank Corks, a pitching coach for Don Baylor and the Rockies. Gary Sheffield whips his bat back toward the pitcher. The head of the bat goes back toward the pitcher and somehow he gets the bat back to the hitting position and gets the head of the bat through the zone as fast as anybody in this league. And that little discussion at the mound was just there to try to calm this young left-hander down because Gary Sheffield has been doing those kinds of things against pitchers for a lot of years now. says Alou will step to the plate against Bobby Jones with two away. And Alou grounds the first pitch to the third baseman, Castilla, who throws it across. And that will do it for the Marlins here in the third, but not before they score two runs on the inside of Park home. series. 
Cougars from Pro Player Stadium. And there is Kurt Abbott, who hit the inside the park home run, giving the Marlins the two-run lead. As Ellis Burks takes strike one here in the fourth. Interesting note on, on Abbott, Jeff. He not only hit the last Marlins inside the park home run, and strike two on Burks, which took place August of 95 against Pete Shurick of the Reds. Just four days prior to that, he hit it inside the park home run against the Rockies, Kevin Ritz. So Abbott with two inside the park home runs, four days apart in 95, as Burks swings and misses. Fifth strikeout and career strikeout number 999 for Alex Fernandez. Well, you're talking about inside the park home runs, and this park is good for it in one spot of it. Right in left center field, it's 434 where the wall goes and has a funny angle. And this park plays big everywhere except directly to left field where the ball seems to shoot out over the high scoreboard. First pitch to Larry Walker. High and outside. Now there's the scoreboard. That's where the ball carries. But if, if you look over in left center field, that's where the big, it, it's almost like old Ebbets Field. There's kind of a nook in the wall. There it is. If the ball gets in there, it rattles around, and it won't hit off directly. It comes off on a funny angle, and if the outfielder goes running in, it bounces over his head, and it's very tough to, to hold a good runner down. Like a pinball machine yes. in center field. Mm -hmm. Fernandez falls behind. Three balls, no strikes. He walked Walker in the first inning. Walker leading the National League at 4.09. Strike one call. You know what's fun to watch is you're watching Charlie Johnson, the catcher for the Marlins, work. Watch how he gives a very quiet target. Now, that very still target doesn't bounce. He gets in position and sets the glove. Watch it. Ball four. Third walk of the game allowed by Fernandez. And Larry Walker once again heads down to first. Well, you can see why he has 27 walks now this season. And one of the reasons is because he's hitting the ball so well that other clubs say, we're not going to let this guy hurt us. The problem you have, unless you have, now fortunately you have, for the Marlins' sake, they have at least one out right here. But if you start doing that with none out, you can have some big innings because these Marlins, I mean, these Rockies can tattoo you for a big innings. But by the same token, also, you have a man who is capable of striking out a lot. Galarraga struck out 157 times last year, so Alex Fernandez figures, well, maybe I can go and bust him hard instead of facing Larry Walker. Galarraga fouls it off. Galarraga already struck out back in the first inning. You know, there's an interesting thing about the big cat, Galarraga, too. He gets hit a lot. If you look at his stance, he's got a very unorthodox stance. Maybe the most open stance you ever see, we'll see. He stands wide open. His left foot is down toward the third base coach. It's incredible. But what they've done that for, Don Baylor got him so he could get both eyes on the pitcher. Walker bluffed, and Galarraga fouls it off. Baylor, of course, hit by more pitches than anybody else in yes. Major League history. Yeah, and he never rubbed either. It was amazing. He hit that big, look at that big body. He just kind of flipped, you know, flipped it off him. But now Galarraga dives into the ball. Now what I, I guarantee, well, I can't guarantee it, but I would think that one of two things they'll do here. They'll try to bust it at his letters inside, or they'll make him chase a breaking ball in the dirt. And that was wrong on both accounts. It was a fastball blown away. But when you have a man who has an open stance, as big as Galarraga, Galarraga and dives into the ball, you can pitch him right up under his arms, right under the letters. Let's see what goes. Here's Charles Johnson giving a sign. They're going inside, it looks like. Now he pitches. No, he goes away now. They're going back away with a breaking ball. And a one-two misses. Ball two. Two and two the count on Andres Galarraga. Larry Walker, the runner on first base, with one out in the fourth. Now, what you'll see a catcher do, the first signs he gives, the finger signs, is a pitch. Then he gives location. 2-2. Two -two. Galarraga held up. And the count is full for the first time tonight. Alex Fernandez has gone to a full count. Well, that pitch looked like a pretty good pitch. Let's see where it's caught on the plate. Had great action right at the end. Now, it might have just missed at the end, but Alex wanted that pitch, but he never showed it to the umpire. Now I think they're going back inside again. Galarraga 
Bishop bounces it over the outstretched glove of the shortstop, Renteria. First base hit of the game for the Rockies as Walker heads down to third. Runners on the corners with one away. Well, it's interesting to see. Whoa. Alex Fernandez just threw a ball back to Charles Johnson, and he was looking in the dugout when he threw it back and almost caught it in the mask. But Charles Johnson just moved out in front of the plate, gave the signs to the infielders. What that sign, set of signs is, is where are we throwing? Are we throwing through to second base? Am I throwing to third base? Am I throwing to the pitcher? And he gets those signs from the dugout. You can see Charles looking in. He will look into the dugout to get help from Jim Leland as to what he wants done here. Dante Bichette lifts the first pitch down the right field line. Bichette fly out to the center fielder Cangelosi leading off the second inning. And there's Jimmy Leland hiding in the corner. He'll give the signs now to his catcher Charles Johnson to show him how he wants this play defended if they try to run here. Walker the runner on third. Galarraga on first. As Bichette fouls off another one. 0-2. set of signs and those most likely Charles Johnson looked in most likely are not pitch signs what they are are where he's going to go if they run is he going to throw to second there's the throw to second as they look to catch Walker who heads back to third Galarraga is in with his eighth stolen base of the season well, what that defensive play was right there, that's the old-fashioned cut across in front of the base and take the throw. Kurt Abbott took the throw in front of the base, and he, that what they were doing was gambling that it was a double steal attempt and that Kurt Abbott was not going to stay back at second base, was coming in, cut it off, and try to throw the runner out the plate. I think he would have gotten Larry Walker at third if the ball had not hung up in his glove on that. So now second and third for the Rockies. One and two count. Here's the pitch to Bichette. He breaks his back. A line drive to the pitcher, Fernandez. Takes it to third himself. And that does it for the Rockies in the fourth. So Fernandez works out of the one-out second and third jam. Back in Miami, a strange double play in the scorebook to end the top of the fourth one unassisted as the pitcher Fernandez caught the line drive and then trotted over to third base as Bobby Bonilla fouls off the first offering from Bobby Jones here in the bottom of the fourth well on that double play ball Alex Fernandez stuff is so good that he broke the Dickens out of Bichette's bat and that's why it was just softly hit back at him Speaking of people hitting the ball, Bobby Bonilla just hit a shot. From the way he's swinging the bat, he's got to be on just about everything. And when a major league hitter gets in a groove, especially a big power hitter, you can hear the rocket of the ball coming off the bat. And he's not missing much at this point. The 0-2 misses outside. And we Four were talking earlier. Strikes. Excuse me, Kenny. We were talking earlier about Bobby Bonilla getting off to such a slow start last year. He was DHing with the Baltimore Orioles and didn't like it, didn't feel comfortable there. And one of the reasons is, if you see a hitter lift his front leg, like Bobby's doing right now, and his timing is off, he'll, he'll lift it too soon, he'll do it too quick, you never know what they're going to do. When you're in a groove, it goes up in the right time, your timing's perfect. And Bonilla lifts this one into left, Bichette going back, it's out of here! before the game personally we were talking about his timing being right on here he is looking lift the front leg and right on the ball boom that ball is not right down the middle that's out over the plate he gets great extension look at this oh is that a pretty stroke now look at this pitch now watch him reach out and catch this thing it's low and away wacko Conai 
Boyd, who flies to left in the second inning. So all three of the Marlins runs coming on home runs, although this uh, shot by Bonilla, the more conventional style, as opposed to the inside of the Parker hit by Kurt Abbott in the third inning. Uh, we mentioned about Bobby Bonilla, what he can do when he gets hot. He finished the year last year just on a tear. He had 28 home runs and 116 RBIs. That's after the first five or six weeks of the season. He was really struggling. And Kurt Abbott, who has regained his breath, caught his breath after inside the park home run, came over and gave him a drink. I think Bobby should have done that with Abbott. Abbott should be resting with his feet up. Two and two the count now on... two starts plus the first two and two-thirds innings today did not allow a home run in 14 and two-thirds innings but has now allowed two in the last four batters I'll tell you what the last one though was not a bad pitch he made a good pitch that was just perfect hitting and Conine is on second walk allowed by Jones Kenny it's amazing to watch statistically in the major leagues that after a home run how many times the next hitter walks the reason for that it's a psychological factor with the pitcher he's saying I don't want to make another mistake and especially in this case he's saying I just made a pretty darn good pitch and I know it's a big league but that ball shouldn't have been hit out of here by Bobby Benia so now he walks the next hitter after in fact getting ahead of him here's Charles Johnson with no outs in the fourth Conine runner on first not much of a threat does not have a stolen base has not attempted a stolen base this season Johnson caught looking back in the second inning and this one's fair down the left field line Conine around second heading for third and Johnson has reached back to first he was about halfway decided otherwise runners on the corners for the Marlins with nobody out this is interesting now here's the ball hit inside third base which you'd normally say is an easy double Charles Johnson who hit the ball is rounding first base and on this Galarraga is the first baseman he sees there's nobody covering second and he takes off look who's covering second base here comes Galarraga he beat Charles Johnson to second base and wisely Johnson held up went back to first base that was an outstanding play by the man they call the big cat Andres Galarraga runners on the corners Conine on third Johnson on first here's the pitcher Fernandez Take strike one. Fernandez rounds it out to the second baseman, Young, leading off the third inning. Now Alex Fernandez in college was an all-star hitter as a DH. He's really a fine athlete. He has five hits this year in 22 at-bats. In fact, four of the five have been doubles. Right, which sets a uh, club record for pitchers for the Marlins. Alex, of course, had not hit in the big leagues. He was always bugging me to death. Hey, Skip, I can hit. I said, go sit down, please. Never, never used him as a pinch hitter. No, but I'll tell you what. If we'd ever gotten down to him and I ran out of players, I, I would have, but I wouldn't tell him that. Yeah, he just, he loves it. You know, he loves to hit. He's such a competitor. the catch. Conine comes in from third. Sacrifice fly for Fernandez. His third run batted in of the season. Well, you know in the National League where the pitchers hit, there are so many things they can do to help themselves, especially with the bat. You take a look at the great brave staff. All those guys, Greg Maddox, John Smoltz, Tommy Glavin, they all know how to handle a bat. They can get a sacrifice down. They can put the ball in play when they need to. And Alex Fernandez has that ability to really help himself. One out, John Cangelosi, who has walked and struck out so far tonight. 
So the Marlins lead 4-0. Check out this pattern, Jeff. The Rockies, in their last three games prior to tonight, as Cangelosi lifts it in the air to center, Burks makes the catch two away. On Sunday, the Rockies fell behind 4-0 to Houston. They came back to win 8-5. On Monday, they fell behind 6-0 to St. Louis. Came back to win 9-7. On Tuesday, again, they fell behind 6-0 to the Cardinals. They did not win that one. They lost 8-6. But in their last four games, including tonight, they fall behind 4-0, 6-0, 6-0, and now 4-0. And they came back to win two of the previous three. I'm sure Don Baylor, the manager, would not like to continue to do it that way, but it, because it's so tough to get down, especially to an outstanding starting pitcher. And they're going against a guy tonight who's got great stuff. But they do have offensive weapons. Renteria fouls it off. Two outs. Bottom of the fourth. Johnson, the runner on first. Two runs in. Including a leadoff or run here in the fourth. Off the bat of Bobby Bonilla. You know, as a manager, you sit in the dugout, you never feel you have enough runs, but there are some clubs especially you feel that way about. And with the Rockies' kind of firepower and, and the ability to run the bases, they can turn uh, a deficit around in a hurry. Well, Kevin Brown, for one, who will start for the Marlins on Saturday, would love to be the beneficiary of, of a four-run lead. He has been tremendously bothered by the lack of run support the last two years. Well, it was last year. He was 17 and 11, and his earned run average was 189, the best in the major leagues by far. Three balls, one strike to count on uh, Renteria. You mentioned Brown was 17 and 11. He was 17 and one when the Marlins scored three or more runs last year. And you're hoping, you know, that's what he's hoping this year with the new big guns they acquired. It'd be a different story. Renteria bounces it to third. Castilla to the second baseman, Young. That does it for the Marlins in the fourth, but not before they score two more runs, including the home run by Ponia. A pair of double plays. You had this guy in Chicago, and, and what a job he has done tonight. Uh, as we said right from the beginning, a great competitor, the, and in great stuff, and a lot of times with great stuff, the only time somebody gets a hit is with like the chopper that Galarraga hit over shortstop. But I'll tell you, Alex Hernandez has really looked tough, only giving up, as we mentioned, the one chopping base hit in four innings. And he is a strong guy. He can finish his own game. And we talked earlier about what kind of condition he's in. You know, people would say, what are you talking about? He's putting... You know, he's more effective at the end of the year. Why is that? Because he will lose weight because the season goes along? No, he puts weight on. And through the study, they found that the size that he is, the strength that he has, and some of your best pitchers are the ones that have the big thighs and the big rear end, like, you know, the power pitchers, Tom Seaver and Nolan Ryan had the big, strong legs. Alex is like that. He is, and you, and you pitch with a strong foundation, and you especially need it in a hot weather climate as opposed to the cold weather climate in Chicago where he spent his first seven big league seasons. Here's Vinny Castilla, who struck out back in the second inning. One of five strikeouts for Fernandez. He misses 2-0. Fernandez, over the first four innings, has thrown 61 pitches which is a good low total at this time in the game. And there's a pitch. When he gets a strike, most of the time, it's not in the middle of the plate. He's right where he wants to be on the corners. And when I was talking about his size and the strength of his legs and the hot weather, I'm meaning in the latter part of the game, you can wear down if you're frail. He's not frail. He's strong, and those strong legs can really help him in his heat. 2-1, call, strike two. Well, Fernandez, as you mentioned, the workhorse last year, second in the American League in both innings pitch and games started. He was fourth in complete games. Record of 16 and 10 last year, five and five so far in 97. 2-2, two -two and Castilla lifts it into right field for a base hit, second hit of the game for the Rockies. Well, there's one of the few mistakes that Alex has made, and, and 
Yeah, Vinny Castillo, not sure how he hit that ball. I don't think it was a strike. It was up and away. But Alex does not want that ball up. When you go away, you don't want it up. You want it down. And you see where it is. It's at least belt high, maybe a little higher, but it's off the plate. I don't know how Castillo got that ball there. And, and that's one of the problems. If you continue to pitch outside, you're going to start leaning out over the plate. Kurt Manwaring takes ball one. Manwaring caught looking in the second inning. something on because you try to get on top of it. It is a difficult thing. So I would, would think that he would still be doing it here, but we'll see. Here's the pitch from Fernandez. Now two balls, two strikes. Uh, as you can see, Charles Johnson, even though he's a big catcher, is very quick. You don't normally see a six foot two big catcher with real quick feet. Charles Johnson, there's a reason why he's won two gold gloves in the National League. He is an exceptional receiver. on the outside corner. So the count is now full. 
Remember, he walked Jones on four pitches in his previous at bat. Castilla on second, Weiss the runner on first, one out. And a full count on the pitcher, Bobby Jones. That's a sin to walk the pitcher, it really is. Those are why they inscribe on the manager's tombstone. The walks killed him. And Jones keeps it fair. Conan with a spin, the throw to third. And Jones safe at first. Another terrific play here in the fifth inning by Conan. That was a great play. That's the play that the real great first baseman make. Watch this. Here comes Conan. He is running right down Bobby Jones's throat. Alex throws a hard fastball. Look at this. Pick it up. Didn't even look. Picked it up and fired a strike to Bobby Benet. And this is an excellent play. This is the kind of play that the great first baseman like Don Mattingly and Keith Hernandez make. And Conan primarily a left fielder prior to this season. Yes, but he had been a first baseman and a good first baseman. And a wide second baseman Abbott off the bat of Young. So Fernandez works out of another jam. First and second with one out. And the Marlins continue to lead 4-0. Back in Miami where the Florida Marlins lead the Colorado Rockies. By the score of 4-0 as we move to the bottom of the fifth inning. Kurt Abbott, one of the heroes today for the Florida Marlins, back in the third inning. And inside the park, home run. Renteria came around to score. Abbott with his third career inside the park, homer. And then in the top of the fifth, with two runners on, two outs, he spares the line drive off the bat of Eric Young. Yep, as you know, the player who makes the tremendous play in the field to end an inning usually leads off the next inning. <laughs> and here is Mr. Abbott. That's true. And here he is. You know, I was just thinking, too, we're talking about all the inside-the-park home runs we've been hearing about in baseball. Nine inside-the-park home runs in Major League Baseball this week. There's another reason for it here in this park. When you have a high fence, those balls don't bounce over the fence. They bounce off them. For example, where he hit that ball, that went off a, uh, a sign out there alongside the scoreboard. And when the ball bounced up, then it bounces back over the outfielder's head. Now, most walls, when they bounce high, will go out of the ballpark for only two bases. Abbott fouls it off. One and two. You mentioned earlier, Abbott knocked out of the starting role last year by Luis Castillo, who's sitting out his fifth consecutive game with a heel injury. To Abbott certainly showing Jim Leland he'd like to remain in the lineup. Mm -hmm. And he lifts this one in the air to center. Burks coming on. And he gathers it in. What a way in the fifth. Well, we saw Abbott's inside the park home run in the third. In the fourth, it was Bobby Bonilla extending the Marlins lead and then the sacrifice fly by Alex Fernandez. And that is where we stand right now. He's nothing. Gary Sheffield returning tonight from the 15A disabled list. One for two. He doubled in the third. Sheffield injuring his left thumb on May 13th in Atlanta. And the first pitch from Jones misses for ball one. So we were talking about Gary Sheffield, and it's his left thumb, his feeling thumb, his thumb and his glove. Sheffield fouls it off. In, in recent days, he said the only physical problem was took place when he wiggled the bat. Yeah, now watch how he, this is part of it. Watch how he cranks the bat back. And there's his swing. And you can see why it might hurt him. Remember, his left hand is his bottom hand on the bat. So that means his top hand rolls over that thumb. But when he gets this bat headed back to the pitcher, it's almost impossible the kind of results he gets. Now, the guy that comes to mind, if you remember, Richie Allen played with the Phillies and several other major league clubs as the MVP with the White Sox of the American League in 71 or 2. He did a little of this with like a 36 to 38 ounce bat. Gary is extremely strong. You can see him wiggle it. And when he first came up, he came up with Milwaukee. He was originally a shortstop. They played him at third. He tried every stance in the book. But then when
when he'd get two strikes on him, he'd spread out. We couldn't get him out. And I was just hoping he didn't try this all the time. Well, sure enough, he did when he went to San Diego. Ellis Parks again, two away in the fifth. Sheffield now one for three in his return. So as I say, when he went to San Diego, he spread it out like that and almost won the triple crown. He became a much better hitter. And Bobby Jones's numbers are pretty good. You know, for a young kid coming up against this Florida Marlin lineup in a hostile ballpark, he's throwing the ball well. I've been impressed with his stuff. Jones has allowed seven hits, four runs in four and two thirds. Alou one for two. Takes ball one. You mentioned the hostile setting. The Marlins have lost only six of 24 here at home this season. Second best home record behind only Atlanta in the National League. Ground ball to the shortstop, Weiss. And Alou is thrown out at first. Close play at first base at a 1-2-3 inning for Jones. Through five in Miami. Lead the Rockies by the score of 4 nothing. As we head to the top of the sixth, coming up after tonight's game, it's Fox Sports News as Tiger Woods chases the Golden Bear. Hideki Aramu signs a mega deal with the New York Yankees. And a recap of the Marlins and the Rockies from Miami. Florida leading it 4 nothing as they look to win their 11th straight at home over the Rockies. Ellis Burks steps in, leading off the sixth inning against Alex Fernandez, who has allowed only three hits over the first five. He has struck out five. Burks 0 for 2. One of the five strikeout victims. And Burks lifted in the air to center. Cangelosi racing over. Makes the catch. Ellis Burks 0 for 3. And that will bring up Larry Walker, who has walked in both of his plate appearances tonight. And for Alex Fernandez, really economizing on his pitches, basically. 80 pitches coming into this inning. And as we said earlier, very strong. And now you can feel a little breeze in the ballpark, and that should cool off a little bit if that transfers down to the field. Want to know the count? Walker, who leads the National League in a number of categories, batting average, runs, extra base hits. Takes a cut at that one, one and one. And here I am talking about the heat, and I hope nobody thinks I'm complaining, because I'll tell you what, we have spent most of the early part of the season in cold weather, and these ball players will take the heat any time over the cold weather. I recall that night in Cleveland, mm. for one. Walker drills it to right. Sheffield back. It's gone. the short fence in right field. Home run number 15 for Larry Walker. Only Jeff Bagwell has hit more among National Leaguers. Now there's probably the reason why Alex Fernandez walked him the first two times. Now watch this shot. Larry Walker with an open stance catches one right in the middle of the plate. An off-speed pitch. Here's the pitch, an off-speed pitch, and Alex sees it go. He's just hoping that it's hit so hard that it won't get up over the fence. That was a line drive streamer, just made it over the fence. But that was an off-speed pitch, either a curveball or a changeup, right in the middle of the plate. Here's Andres Galarraga, takes strike one, right down the middle. National League leading 73rd home run of the season, hit by the Colorado Rockies. And you mentioned in the open, Four Rockies have combined to hit now 51, 50 coming in, more than 12 National League teams. Only the Montreal Expos, as a team, have hit more than the four Rockies combined. You know, Kenny, you're talking about what the Rockies can do. Let's, let's look back on last year. I mean, had a sensational year offensively, correct? Galarraga hit 47 home runs. Castilla hit 40 home runs. Burks hit 40 home runs. Bichette hit 31. You had three guys in the top five in the league. One and two. And then in RBIs, Galarraga led the league with 150. Number two was Bichette with 141. Number five was Burks with 128. 
I think some of these Rockies get penalized in voting for MVP because of Coors Field. Everybody said, well, it's not, you know, it's not fair to compare. For an example, Ellis Burks was number three in the voting. Well, I can understand that when you're talking about Alex Rodriguez and Juan Gonzalez. And of course, Gonzalez beat out Rodriguez for the MVP, but these guys are good hitters, and they're good hitters. It doesn't matter what ballpark they're in. Yes, they get some help because of the altitude the balls carry there, and they play so many home games, but they can hit. Well, some of the numbers were staggering. When you look at the home and road numbers, Galarraga stays alive. If you look at Galarraga's stats from 1996, for example, at home, at Coors Field, 32 home runs, 103 runs batted in on the road 15 and 47 a lot of guys can say that but i think it's magnified with the rockies the rockies at home last year 55 and 26 on the road nearly reversed 28 and 53 this season they have fared better on the road just two games under 500 well last year we did several broadcasts of their games and i was asking don baylor what's the problem he says well it becomes a cumulative effect and they start worrying about it and they start hitting in a different way they try to pull the ball is now full on Galarraga. He said he heard all sorts of stories. They say, well, the breaking ball is uh, not as sharp on, at home, so we get an advantage there. Well, maybe that's the case, he said. We go on the road. The problem seems to be is that we come out of our game. We should stay and do the same thing we do at home. Galarraga fouls another one off. Well, Clint Hurdle, first base coach, also doubles as the batting coach. He's the fifth Rockies batting coach in five years. And when Hurdle was hired, Larry Walker was quoted as saying, when we play at home, he might as well go on vacation to Hawaii. <laughs> we don't need him. The payoff pitch, and Galarraga drills it to center. Back-to-back -back home runs, Larry Walker and Andres Galarraga. Coors Field, Jeff? <laughs> You're right. We're not. That ball looked like we were, though. When you hit a ball at dead center field in a backdrop, and it's 405 at the the top of the fence, and this ball was crushed. Watch this pitch. Now, this ball is out over the plate. And you can tell that Alex Fernandez, at the end of this, watch his reaction. He knows, like, oh, no, I know I didn't want that pitch right there. Again, that was a pitch out, out over the plate. If you're going to go away from hitters, for the young kids out there as pitchers, if you're going to pitch away from hitters, you pitch them down. Pass balls and breaking balls down. If you're going inside and you're not a sinker baller, run it at the letters. And it's easy for me to say sitting up here. I got real smart coming up here. Bichette looks to make it three for three. Dante Bichette with his seventh. center and now left I'll tell you what, not one of them is cheap now watch this here's the pitch another very good pitch as far as on the location on the plate away but it's up in the strike zone again and that leaves here in a hurry and you can say it again it is not Coors Field folks this is not necessarily a hitter's ballpark especially not to right and center and that's where two of these three went and with that the bullpen of the Marlins gets going in a hurry Let's see what Vinny Castilla can do. You know, one of the things you say, too, about a pitcher, when they start to get a little tired, and we talked about it before about how strong Alex is, but we worried about the heat. When a pitcher gets a little tired, he doesn't lose his stuff as much as he loses the location. And Alex is not located very well. And see, to illustrate that, we said he hasn't lost his stuff. Now, he just threw another fastball right by Castilla up in the strike zone. He had thrown a fastball by Galarraga before he hit the ball out of the ballpark. Then he missed on location out over the plate where they could get their hands extended. And Castilla throws it foul down the left field line. Back 
to back to back home runs off the bats of Walker, his 15th, Galarraga, number 12, and Bichette, seventh. What you have to do now, and one of the things that we really worked with Alex when he was a young pitcher is back off there where he's standing right now. Take a couple deep breaths. Instead of trying to throw with all your might, go to some breaking stuff. It makes you stay on the ball, and it changes speeds. Go for the breaking ball for a couple pitches here. Or bounce the ball. Make him chase one. The 0-2. what he did right there now see he is so emotional he reached back and tried to throw the ball 200 miles an hour he got lucky that Castillo didn't hold up his swing that was way up in the strike zone now here's the pitch now you can see he throws a rocket now he's pointing to him to tag the hitter because he knows it's been called, but he is really gunned up right now, and he's really got to get back within himself. Here's Kurt Manwaring. So ironically, after he allows three consecutive home runs, Castilla becomes career strikeout victim number 1,000 for Alex Fernandez. Tonight, the third time in Rockies history they have hit back-to-back-to-back -back -back home runs, the last... July of 96, Bichette, Galarraga, and Castilla against Pete Harnish of the New York Mets. Two and two now with two outs. Kurt Manwaring 0 for 2. Action in the Marlins bullpen. And there a strikeout number 1,001. Wild sixth inning. Three consecutive home runs for the Rockies. Walker, Galarraga, and the ship. We head to the bottom of the sixth inning. Here in Miami, the crowd at Pro Player Stadium silence. As Alex Fernandez, who had allowed three home runs on the season coming in, allows three in a row. Who led 4 0. See the Rockies chip away. It is now a one run lead. And you can see Alex, it is hot. We talk about how hot it is. He's changing his shirt. He had gotten a dry undershirt. It is muggy here. Bobby Bonilla bounces to the third baseman, Castillo, who makes the play to Galarraga. One away. And Bobby Jones has retired the last seven Marlins. Yeah, I don't know how Don Baylor, the manager of the Rockies, does it. You know, they get way down, they come back. They get way up, and the other team comes back if they're at home. Their pitching seems to struggle, especially at Coors Field. Their earned run average of their team is over five at the bottom of the league, as they were last year, even though they're improved. They're improved almost a half a run a game. And he's had to use so many young pitchers. I don't know how he stays so patient just sitting there. Jeff Conine, 0 for 1. He walked and scored a run his last time up. There's Frank Punk, the pitching coach, chewing on that gum. Jones misses 2 and 0 on Conine. When he got a good hitting club like that, the thing they say in the dugout, hold him there, we'll get him. Hold him close, we'll get him. Center fielder Burks makes the play. Two outs in the sixth. Well, we were talking about how Alex Fernandez early in the game had no hit type stuff. He still has real hard fastball because he got mad out there after he hit the three home runs and threw the ball right by Castilla and Marinwari. But that's dangerous when you're out there rocking and rolling trying to throw too hard. But this youngster. Bobby Jones out of New Jersey, Rutherford High School, has really stayed in there. Charles Johnson with the ground ball to the second baseman, Young. Second consecutive 1-2-3 inning for Jones.
next time you attend a Major League Baseball game, turn to your right. This could be your neighbor. Evil Knievel. 4-3 Marlins lead, and you can catch more exciting sports action on Monday. Major League Baseball on FX. On the East Coast, you'll see the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. Out West, the Toronto Blue Jays and the Seattle Mariners. It's Major League Monday on FX. Well, Major League Thursday here in Miami on the Fox Sportsnet. Alex Fernandez was sailing right along over the first five innings until the uh, heavy hitters stepped to the plate in the sixth. And Walker, Galarraga, and Bichette tagged Fernandez back to back to back home runs. Three home runs hit on five pitches. And now Fernandez moves into the seventh as he will face Walt Weiss and then a pinch hitter for the pitcher Bobby Jones, John Vanderwall, waiting in the on-deck circle. Well, that is the eighth time that the Rockies have hit three home runs in one inning in their franchise history, and the second time this year. They did it earlier in Montreal. Weiss, one for two on the evening. And I'm sure it, it will happen again at some point. <laughs> You know, I look at Alex Fernandez, and it makes me think of his first Major League start. He started in Milwaukee in August of 1990, and in his first start, I took him out of the game after seven innings. He was leading 3-2, to two, and he didn't want to come out of the game. As he came off the field, I said, Alex, that's a great outing. He said, what do you mean? Aren't I staying in the game? I said, no, we have an outstanding setup guy. And Barry Jones, and I said, I'll follow him with Bobby Thigpen, who just happened to save 57 that year, set the major league record, and Alex said, Skip, no, I can still pitch. You know, here's a brash young kid. I mean, he is an aggressive pitcher. To add to that story, excuse me, after the ball was fouled off, we blew the lead for him. We won the game, but we blew his lead, and after the game, he kind of looked at me plaintively like, uh, well, I, I could have done that. What happened the next time out? I think he had a complete game. He didn't mess around. He didn't give me a chance to mess it up. Weiss steps out. Two balls, two strikes. Walt Weiss, the leadoff man here in the seventh inning for the Colorado Rockies. And we have mentioned uh, their recent pattern of falling behind and then coming back. They did it twice in the last three games. Sunday, they trailed St. Uh, Houston 4 0. They won the game 8 5. Monday, fell behind 6 0 to the Cardinals, came back to win 9 7. They trailed today 4 0. It is now 4 3 as Weiss lifts it in the air on the edge of the infield. Renteria makes the catch. One away in the seventh. And now John Vanderwall will pitch hit for the pitcher Bobby Jones. Vanderwall this season, 2 of 14. He set a major league record two years ago with 28 pinch hits. Last year, hit three pinch hit home runs, yet another former Montreal Expo. When you look around the rosters of both these clubs, you have Moises Alou on the Marlins and Larry Walker, Andres Galarraga, John Vanderwall on the Rocky side. You know, talking about, you're talking about some outstanding hitters, but you're talking about all-stars in, in two of the three with the Rockies. How about the Montreal Expos losing an all-star outfield of Alou Grissom and Larry Walker losing two closers, outstanding closers in Wetland and Rojas, two number one pitchers in uh, Kenny Hill and Fazero, and they still win. Felipe Alou, you know, he sees his son and his nephew leave for greener pastures, and he still wins. I mean, he, he's an amazing manager, and that organization's really done some job staying afloat. Here's the 1-1, Vanderwall swings and misses. Of course, it's the small market versus big market picture. When you look at the money, Alou, for example, uh, is able to earn here in, in Miami as opposed to in Montreal. Aaron Holmes in the Rockies' bullpen. Strike three, so the pinch hitter Vanderwall goes down on strikes. Eight strikeout for Fernandez. That ties the season high. Look at this. This 
has a very strange rotation. Look at this rotation on this ball. It almost looks like a split finger rotation, but it's not. It's a fastball that he holds with two seams, meaning that the, you don't have a full backspin look at the ball. Two outs for Eric Young. Young 0 for 3. You talked about Eric Young before. This was a terrific two-sport athlete at Rutgers University, an outstanding football player as well. I figured you'd bring up Rutgers again. Well, I had to. We didn't get a chance to talk about it before, but Eric did some job. Here he was married with a child in college, playing two sports, and he graduated. Then he went to the Dodger organization, was an outfielder, converted to second base. This kid has made himself a terrific player. Young lifts it in the air. Stays in the infield. Second baseman Abbott makes the catch. One, two, three inning for Fernandez. Seventh inning stretch time in Miami. Welcome back to Baseball Thursday on a hot sports set from Pro Players Stadium in Miami, where the Marlins lead the Rockies by the score of four. Three as we move to the bottom of the seventh inning. And inside the park home run for Kurt Abbott of the Marlins, Alex Fernandez records career strikeout number 1,000, immediately following three consecutive home runs against Fernandez by Walker, Galarraga, and Bichette. Kenny Albert, Jeff Torborg, back with you. And uh, this has turned into a wild ball game as the Marlins look to win their 11th straight at home against the Rockies. We had an inside the park home run hit earlier by Abbott and then three in a row in the last inning by the Rockies. Well, it's been kind of a strange game in some ways. You thought maybe the young left-hander Bobby Jones would leave here early. He got banged around a little bit. And Alex Fernandez was just completely dominating the Rockies, but with one short period of time, he made some mistakes in his location, and, and the next thing you know, it's a 4-3 to three ball game, which is what the Rockies can do to you. And the new pitcher for the Rockies is Darren Holmes. 31-year-old right-hander in his fifth season with Colorado in relief of Bobby Jones, who settled down to retire the last nine Marlins he faced. Now, the pinch hitter for the Marlins is Cliff Floyd, batting for the pitcher Alex Fernandez. Floyd 0 for 7 as a pinch hitter this season. First time I saw Floyd, he was playing another Montreal Expo. He was a young kid, just only a year and a half out of high school. I was managing the Mets saw him in spring training. I couldn't believe the package this guy has. He's a big kid who runs well, six foot five, weighs 220 some pounds, runs well, and now he's a bench player here. But he had broken his hand, or his, actually his wrist, in a terrible collision with Todd Hunley of the Mets. Uh, they had to surgically repair it. I think five or six bones were broken and had to be put back in place. This guy's a very talented kid. Before his career is over, I think he's going to be more than a bench player. And Floyd, the ground ball, the second baseman, Young, throws him out. And ten consecutive Marlins have gone down. The last base runner was Charles Johnson, who singled in the fourth. John Cangelosi, 0 for 2 against Jones, a little walk. Darren Holmes making his 13th appearance of the season. And the first pitch to Cangelosi is low for ball one. Darren Holmes came over to this ball club in the draft. He had originally been with the Dodgers, then he went to the Milwaukee Brewers and had been a closer with the Brewers. And then when he joined the Rockies, Don Baylor used him as their closer. He had 25 saves in 1993. One and one. He's got a great curveball, a straight downer curveball. If we watch the shots of him pitching, a straight downer curveball is a difficult pitch to get called for a strike. One of the things you see with a guy, and I see him wrap the ball behind him, and there, that's a fastball that they foul off. But if you watch Darren Holmes and watch the hand behind him, when he takes his hand back, he call it what we call he's a wrapper behind him. He hooks his or hooks his wrist behind him. A lot of good breaking ball pitchers, Don Sutton, for an example, Rich Sutcliffe, were able to do that and had real big curveballs. One-one to 
Cangelosi calls strike two. Well, maybe John was looking for the curveball, and he got the express there. That was a good fastball on the outside part of the plate. But as I was starting to say, when you have like a 12 to 6 straight down curveball like Sandy Kopex used to have, very difficult pitch to get called, especially now with a strike zone that seems to be a little lower. But I want to say something. Randy Mark has done some job tonight. He has been very, very consistent. That's all you ask of an umpire. Exceptional umpiring job tonight in this ballgame. 1-2. This is inside. Two balls, two strikes. Randy Marsh, along with Jeff Kellogg at first, the crew chief Harry Wendelstadt at second, Larry Poncino working down at third base. 4-3 lead for the Marlins. All three Rockies runs coming on back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back homers in the sixth. The 2-2 from Holmes, and he strikes out Cangelosi. A fastball. He didn't even mess around with his good curveball. And maybe, you know, sometimes pitchers start relying on one pitch too much. Maybe what they're afraid of is he cannot get that thing called enough, so he doesn't he doesn't throw it until he gets way up in the count, so he doesn't take a chance of getting himself in trouble. Edgar Renteria steps in. Renteria extended his hitting streak to 13 games with a single in the third. They were out to score in front of Abbott, who hit the inside of the park homer. High 2-0. Oh. Renteria for the hit now in 13 straight, 18 of his last 19, and the average has come up. 185 to above 260. Two and one. I'll tell you, Darren Holmes isn't messing around. He's he's uh, flying off on his breaking ball, so he's staying with the fastball and he's throwing it right by these hitters. You talk about young Edgar Renneria. One of the things he does so well as a young hitter, he goes to right center field. He goes to the other side of the field. He doesn't pull off the ball a lot. Most of you good young hitters, and you can see he kind of snaps and wiggles the bat a lot like um, Gary Sheffield, but he's not able to get it going like Sheffield does. He's just swung and missed at two high fastballs. That's the problem. When you take the head of the bat and lean it back or, or aim it back toward the pitcher, you're going to have a tough time catching up to the high fastball as he just uh, missed one by about a foot. You can see him cocking the bat like Sheffield. 2-2, two -two, Retoria stays alive. Now, here you'll watch. See how he hooks it toward the pitcher like Sheffield? Except Sheffield gets it into a hitting position a little quicker. And when Gary Sheffield gets the bat up over his shoulder, it's still not aiming at the pitcher. It's flattened out. This kid never quite gets it all the way back. That's why he does hit a lot of balls the other way. Because Count he has to. Now. Count is full on Renteria. With two outs, bottom of the seventh. Darren Holmes in relief of Bobby Jones, who went six innings, allowed four runs on seven hits. Two walks, two strikeouts, two home runs. The payoff pitch, and Renteria fouls another one off. Well, after he just hit the ground with his bat, he better check it again. I've seen guys in anger swing at the ground like that and break their bat. No, he did. He looked at the handle. Probably said to himself, I got better wood on the ground than I did any of these pitches from Holmes. Tie behind first base. Coming up for the Rockies in the eighth. Burks, followed by Walker and Galarraga. <laughs> Not going through that lineup a couple times a day. Another foul. Well, Renneria is hanging tough. It's, it's interesting to watch different guys. That's why different types of hitting. That's why when you have a, a young player that you say are watching Major League players say, well, Gary Sheffield can do it. That doesn't mean you can do it. There are a lot more ways than one to be able to hit, but not every one is good for everyone. Not every technique is good for everyone. Ball four, so Renteria, who battled, fouled off four consecutive pitches. That's 
down to first. Two out walk. Allowed by Holmes. You know, in my career, I tried to copy so many hitters, and none of them worked. The thing to do for a young player is just to make sure they're comfortable at the plate. Because if you're not comfortable to begin with, you don't have a chance at hitting. And that's why you see some unorthodox stances. You say, how can that work? Well, the person who's in them happens to be comfortable. Like Andres Galarraga with that open stance, he can see the pitcher well. Here's Kurt Abbott as Holmes keeps Renteria close to the bag. Renteria stole second back in the third inning. Now you say you tried to, to copy a number of hitters. The question is, which young hitters tried to emulate Jeff Torboy? None, I hope. I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to ruin a career in a hurry. Abbott hits a long foul down the right field line. But as so often happens, I was a good hitter in college. I went to the minor leagues, didn't get enough at bats, went right to the big leagues after two and a half months in the minor leagues. And it really stymied my development. And then I started to doubt myself. And that's what happens when a lot of kids are rushed to the big leagues. They get to the big leagues and think that the players are playing against their superhuman. They are the best of the crop, you know, best in the business. But you, if you start to, to doubt yourself, then you try all sorts of things, and then you really come out of your abilities. One and one the count on Kurt Abbott. Two outs in the seventh as Kurt Manwaring Mary, heads out to the mound to chat with Darren Holmes. Now you're talking about types of head games, psychologically thinking about the game. How about Bruce Ruffin, the closer, the left-handed closer for this Colorado Rocky Ball Club? He's in the minor leagues now because all of a sudden he could not throw a strike. I mean, he went into a game, uh, I believe it was in New York, and on three hitters in a row, he only threw two balls anywhere near the plate, and he's in the minor leagues now trying to recover. He's back with his old pitching coach from the days with the Phillies, Jim Wright. He's just trying to get his head back in gear. Retoria heading towards second. No throw. Ninth stolen base of the season. Second tonight for Retoria. Now, something happened here because there was no one covering second base. And if you're going to call a pitch out, that means your infielders have to know what pitch is there. Now it's a, also a bad pitch out. Now, here's the jump. Oh, he really breaks early. But it is a pitch out, meaning that the ball is thrown away from the plate. The problem is it's not a good pitch out. It pulls Kurt Merrimwaring farther away from the plate and throws his rhythm off. Look how he had to reach out. Nobody is covering. Now, middle infielders play off the catcher's signs. They just missed that sign. 2-1, ball strike two. You know what I mean? The shortstop usually looks in, the second baseman looks in to see what the catcher's sign is. They'll play off that pitch. For example, if you have a pull hitting right, a right-handed hitter who pulls the ball, you look for the signs. Then you play off the signs. They didn't even see a pitch out. 2-2 two -two from Holmes. Abbott fouls it back. Now there was the curveball. That's one of the few curveballs he's thrown in this, this inning, and that used to be his out pitch. But, you know, the game, the inside of the game is so important. That's a communication between the catcher and the pitcher, the catcher and the infielders. You'll watch the signs. Now, these will be a group of signs because there's a runner at second. Now, he went through the same thing again. Now, the pitcher said, do him again. You can see this double shot here, and the pitcher said, do him again. So, Kurt Manwaring said, okay, I'm going to do him again. There's a runner at second. Here we go. the pitch from Holmes in the dirt ball three so the count is full on Kurt Abbott now the runner at second base if you have an experienced runner at second base which we don't have in this situation guys have been around the game a while will try to select the signs and watch them see if they can and relay them to the hitter now let's see if we can get them I think a wiggle four is a curveball let's see so you're going fastball fastball away so this is going to be a fastball I would believe Now, a lot of catchers will do different things. When they give the signs, if they give the signs with their fingers, they'll pat either the right leg or the left leg, and that'll give location. Other pitchers, other catchers, I said, should say, will give location with their pinky. If they give it with their pinky, it means it's a way to a right-hander. If they give it with the index finger, it's in. Now, there he goes, the pinky. He's going to go away with a fastball. Here's the pitch, and Abbott fouls another one off. Does that make sense? See, I wasn't coordinated enough to give the pinky for a 
pitch away to a right-hander. So I would give the signs, and then I would pat either leg. I wanted to make sure that the pitcher knew what location I wanted. I didn't want him to cut the difference and throw it down the middle. Let's look again. There's a fastball. And yes, folks, Jeff is giving the signs here in the broadcast booth. Uh -huh. Abbott fouls yet another pitch off. Well, by watching man where you can see what he's doing, he's doing it. I think he's using the last sign, but I'm not sure. And if you see a number one, that's his fastball. If it's an index finger number one, it's inside. If it's a little finger, a pinky finger, it's away. But if you see go wiggle four, it's going to be a curveball. So let's see what happens. Looks like another fastball. Abbott lifts it in the air to left. Shallow left field, Bichette. Makes the catch, and that retires the side in the seventh. One runner left on, seven complete, 4-3 Marlins. James Powell yeah, break. will be the new Florida Marlins pitcher. In relief of Alex Fernandez. Powell will make his 25th appearance of the season. Tops on the Marlins staff. Boy, those are good numbers coming out of that bullpen. And Jimmy Leland is trying to put together a bullpen behind excellent starting pitching when you talk about Kevin Brown and Al Leiter and Alex Fernandez and Pat Rapp. And so what he's doing is building a bullpen. And this towel has got an excellent arm. And, of course, their closer is Rob Nen, who throws well. So... You know, this is could be the complete package before the season's over. Now that Sheffield's back, and if they can get Devon White back. And it's interesting to see what goes on between innings. There's Kurt Manwaring, the catcher, talking with Darren Holmes about how you want to get, what we want to do when we go back there. They go over the hitters. That's excellent. The catcher is a teacher. He's a leader. He is, he's also a psychologist. You see how he tapped him on the leg. I like that. inning for the Rockies. It will be Burks, Walker, and Galarraga against Jay Powell. As Burks takes strike one, he's over three. Struck out in the fourth, fly to center twice. Jay Powell came up in the Orioles system, first round pick in 1993. Traded to the Marlins in a deal for Brett Barbary out of Mississippi State two years ago. Powell named the Marlins Organizational Pitcher of the Year. 25-year-old right-hander. One-one to Burks. Two balls, one strike. Kenny's a big guy. When you get a big pitcher, he's 6'4", 225, and he drops his arm a little bit, a little bit below his shoulder. It's what we call uh, a three-quarter pitcher. It's very tough on a right-handed hitter. If you can take a shot at it, you can see where he throws kind of low. He doesn't come over his head. And Burks drills it into the gap to the right center. This will be for extra bases. Burks around second, heading for third. And he is in with a leadoff triple here in the eighth. Well, here's something that the Rockies can do. They, and they have tried to do it. And Don Baylor is going out now to see if if Ellis Burks is all right. He, he had been plagued by a groin strain. In yes. fact, he did not start Tuesday's game. And they had an off day yesterday. But the thing that you look at and what the Rockies have attempted to do is when they go on the road to make sure they stay in the middle of the field or the other way. And that's what Ellis Burks did. He took the pitch, which was a sidearm fastball right here. Now watch. On the outer half of the plate, and he drove it into right center. See where it's way out over the plate. And Burks went that way. He didn't try to pull off the ball. And that's what they are consciously trying to do, especially on the road. Burks. And now here's Larry Walker. Walked twice and Homer in his last at bat. Huge sixth inning for the Colorado Rockies. First, it was Walker with his 15th of the season. Then Colorado with number 12, followed by the seventh homer of the year off the bat of Dante Bichette. Back to back to back as the Rockies who trailed 4-0, have cut the deficit to 4-3. And 
now have the leadoff man on third in the eighth inning. Walker with the home run up to 4-12. Leading the National League. Oh, he lines it off the pitcher, Powell. Walker safe at first. Burks remains on third. Runners on the corners. A line shot off Powell. Remember, folks, you've got a six foot four pitcher when he strides is about 54 feet away from home plate. Look at this line, one hopper off his arm. There's not a thing he can do about it. He's just kind of defending himself. Ow, and that hit his pitching arm. That hit up around the uh, bicep area of his pitching arm. Ellis Gertz couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't try to score on that. They're trying to make the ball go through before they do anything. So you have runners at first and third. Now Andres Galarraga, two for three. Home at his last plate appearance. Ball one, so Burks, the runner on third. Walker on first base. Rockies look to erase the deficit. Here's the pitch from Powell. Foul behind the third base bag. Well, fortunately, that uh, Marlon Fielder is in foul ground. The ball boy bobble the ball around a little bit, but you can see what the book is really how to pitch most of this this uh, rocky lineup you got to pitch him inside you pitch him out over the plate they'll either knock you off the mound or hit one out of center field you really have to pitch him in and now block towards first Jimmy Leland out of course defensively because he does have a one run lead He's playing his infield back they're trying to keep it from being a real big inning they're giving up as you look around they're playing back they're looking for a double play they're, they'll give up a run here on a ground ball the one one and Galarraga takes a cut at it one and two that was a nasty uh, breaking ball it might have been a split finger the way the bottom fell out of it and it was out away from him. I just finished talking about pitching him in. But I'll tell you, if you have a breaking ball like this or an off-speed pitch where the bottom comes out of it, well, then you can pitch away. But the way they dive out over the plate, unless you get away away, they're going to tattoo you. Alaraga fouls it back. So the count remains one ball, two strikes. Nobody out, top of the eighth. Works the runner on third. Larry Walker on first. Now remember we just saw those three home runs and remember where every pitch was. They were out over the plate. One was an off-speed pitch to Larry Walker. Another was a high fastball out over the plate to Colorado. The next was a, a fastball or cutter out over the plate to Bichette. They were all out of the plate. When you got a big guy, he's got to get his arms extended. Off the bat of Galarraga. And you see where that pitch was. It was right on his hands. Davis Shett waiting on deck. Rockies leading the National League now with 75 home runs, including the three tonight. Back in the sixth inning. Seven runs in the game, six coming via the long ball. There have been five home runs. The only uh, other run came on a sacrifice fly hit by the pitcher, Fernandez. That was the Marlins' fourth run of the game. Abbott with the two-run inside the park home run, and then Bonilla with the solo shot to lead off the fourth. Yeah, Rob Nen, their closer, stretching it out. The guys in the bullpen knows what know what their roles are, and they know when they're going to be called on. They start to get ready, especially the closers. Galarraga swings and misses and goes down on strikes for the second time tonight. Now this is an excellent pitch. After running a fastball in on his hands that he fouled off, they went away with a breaking ball. And they got it way away. See how far away from the plate it was? It was a good four to six inches out there. And he was fooled badly. This is an off-speed pitch, and that's... Uh, he says, ah, oh, shoot. I know I shouldn't have swung it that way. Is that what he said? I think so. <laughs> One away in the eighth. Dante Bichette steps in against Jay Powell. Bichette one for three with a homer. Runners on the corners. 
as the set takes ball one. Burks with the leadoff triple on third base. Walker, who bounced one off the pitching arm of Powell, on at first. Now you're looking at it from Jay Powell's perspective. Here's the shot you're facing him. You want to keep the ball down in the strike zone if you can to get a double play. If you get it up, that's when you get fly balls and be a sacrifice fly. The pitcher Powell to Abbott. There it is, double play. And the Marlins get out of the inning. The Rockies had runners on the corner with no. Telecast is presented by the authority of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without express written consent. Well, here's a play to end the top of the fifth inning. This is what wins ball games, folks. Kurt Abbott stayed on that base and got smoked. The throw was a little high. He stayed with it and got the throw off in the face of really being injured. Those are the kind of plays that really win ball games. That's the second or third type of time he has made an outstanding play. And the first pitch to Gary Sheffield from Darren Holmes. This is for ball one. That the second time, Jeff, that Dante Bichette has come up with one out and two runners on. And he lined into a double play in the fourth to the pitcher Fernandez, who then stepped on third base, and this time bounces to the pitcher Powell. Well, that will happen. He has been pitched very well, except for the home run. One ball jammed, and that ball was out off the plate down. Sheffield fouls it off. One and two. Now, that ball was tapped right back to the pitcher, and when Powell turned to throw, uh, I thought for a minute that he was going to throw the ball away. It was so high, and I don't know how Abbott stayed with it. Remember, Abbott's coming from the right side, coming back to the base, and it, it took him off the base, and here comes the runner bearing down on him. Terrific play. Second base hit of the night. Rolls to the wall in the left. And Sheffield makes the turn at second and cuts back. His second double of tonight's game. Well, we talked about what a big part of this team he is. And we were talking also about the quick bat. Watch this, folks. This is a bullet on a curveball. He reaches out again. It gets extension. The ball comes off the wall. There's no chance even if after bobbling the ball you get him at second base. Gary Sheffield can fly for a big guy. Now Sheffield with a leadoff double. And now Moises Alou, one for three. Darren Holmes working his second inning. Bobby Jones, the starter, went six. Holmes covering first, but Sheffield moves down to third base. We talked about what it takes to win ball games. We talked about in, this, in the face of being injured, a defensive play by Kurt Abbott. Here is a big, high-profile player giving himself up for his team. Now, a lot of people say, oh, wait a minute. Don't give yourself up hitting the ball to the right side. Yeah, you're not trying to make it out. You're trying to at least move the runner. Hopefully a base hit. But here's a power hitter, and Alou moves Sheffield to third base with less than two outs. Now that wins ball games. And here's Bobby Bonilla, who homered in the fourth. Also single, two for three. Weak grounder to the third baseman, Castilla. Goes to first, now the throw to home. And Sheffield is safe. Manuel could not hold on to the baseball. I'll tell you what, this is a great play. This is vintage Maury Wills. We used to have a play with a great Dodger shortstop, Maury Wills, who was a great base runner. If he's at third base, running down the line and following the, the fielder in. Now watch this. This is a great instinctive baseball play by Gary Sheffield. Bobby Benet hits a chopper. Now watch Vinny Castillo looks at the runner. He's got to make a decision. He throws the first. The minute he threw the first base, Gary Sheffield came for the plate. Now, in essence, he probably should have been beaten because it's, I mean, he should have been out because of throw beating. Great slide, but great instinctive baseball. I just love to see that. That was terrific. 
So Sheffield, with the leadoff double, comes around to score without the ball, leaving the infield. He moved to third on the ground ball to the right side, hit by Alou, and then scores on the ground to the third, hit by Bonilla. Now watch the play. Look at Sheffield, where he's coming. He's running right behind. Oh, you can't see him, but Castillo can. He ran right up the line with him, just stayed two steps behind him. And here he comes. Man, he almost broke his ankle, too, as Spikes caught, and he bounced in the home plate. He also did something at the end of the play you don't like to see. He went back and tagged the home plate after home plate umpire Randy Marsh called him safe. Don't do that. That makes the umpire look bad. But Gary Sheffield, that is great aggressive baseball. He just got back in that lineup, and he can make things happen. One and two, the count on Conine. Called strike three. Second strikeout for Holmes. And now the Rockies down to their final three outs. It will be Castilla, Manwaring, and White. as we head to the top of the ninth in Miami. Coming up after tonight's game, it's Fox Sports News as Tiger Woods chases the Golden Bear. The Yankees sign a Decky Arabu to a monster deal. And a recap of the Marlins and the Rockies as Rob Nen will look to close things out. The Marlins all-time saves leader, 35 last year fourth in the National League this year with 13 saves. His numbers aren't the same as he was last year. His earned run average elevated, as you can see. He's a big, hard thrower, 6'5", 210. His father was a major league player with the Dodgers and the Senators and the Texas Rangers. Rob Nen throws hard. But he also has one of the most unorthodox deliveries you'll ever want to see. He takes his left foot and he taps it on the mound before he comes to the plate. It's almost like a hesitation. Most pitchers lift their front leg, drive out over the front leg, and drive the ball to the plate. He brings his foot back toward the rubber, taps it first on the ground, and then strides forward. And Castillo lifts it in the air to deep center field. Cangelosi back at the wall. This is one of the toughest plays for any outfielder. The ball hit right over his head. And unfortunately, he had a little time because it was up over his head, high enough. But he's running out of room. Catches it one step from the wall. Remember, the outfielders judge where they are on the wall according to the warning track. They know they've got three to four steps after they hit that track. That's why it's there. That was a nice play by Cangelosi. He stayed with that one. Kurt Manwaring takes ball one. Now see the warning track be behind outfielders. They have that judge. If they hit that on the dead run, they know they only have three to four more steps before they hit the wall. Now 2-0, oh, the count on Kurt Manware. One other change here in the ninth for the Marlins. Alex Arias has come in, replacing Bobby Bonilla at third base. 5-3 lead for the Marlins. Three Rockies runs coming in the sixth. Back to back to back homers. Walker, Galarraga, and Bichette. Two and one the count on Manwaring. Rob Nen looking to pick up save number 14. Well, we talked about how big Nen is and the leverage he gets. For an example, last year in 83 innings, he struck out 92 men. When you have more strikeouts than innings pitch, you know you're really throwing hard. He's got the good mid to upper 90s fastball. Just misses. And out, out of this kind of strange delivery, Kenny, where he hesitates by tapping the rubber, I think it's got to throw the hitters off. I mean, first of all, he's so darn big. And he throws so hard, but the little strange delivery doesn't help. All four, so the tie and run will step to the plate. One out in the ninth. As we take a look back at our EA Sports play of the game, it took place in the third inning. Bobby Jones on the mound. Kurt Abbott with the drive to center. And he would come around and inside the park home run. Renteria would score, followed by Abbott, 
his third career inside the park homer. He's also been a stalwart in the field as the Marlins look to win their 11th consecutive game at home over the Rockies. And now a, a pinch runner, Quinton McCracken, will run for Kurt Manwer. At the plate, Weiss, one for three. Well, we were talking before about Eric Young being a good football player. Quentin McCracken, of course, is an excellent football player at Duke University. Weiss takes a cut at strike one. He was a starting defensive back for four years at Duke and another two-sport star something about some of these athletes that can play two sports in college and graduate from outstanding academic institutions. Weiss lifts it in the air. To shallow left and a shortstop, Renteria, will make the catch in fair territory. And the Marlins one out away from winning for the 12th time in the last 15 games. Well, that's another play. It looks like an easy play. And you see Jim Leland, it's never easy. You think his stomach still isn't rolling? All the wins he's had managing, he just, now the sign he just gave over his head was don't let anything get over your head. Meaning don't let anything from this hitter get over the outfielder's head to put this hitter in scoring position. And we have a pinch hitter, Jeff Reed. Reed in his 14th Major League season. with five clubs, and he will pinch hit for the pitcher, Holmes. Reed one for two as a pinch hitter this year. Rockies down to their last out. McCracken, the runner, at first base. Two away in the ninth. You know, when a, a manager holds his breath the most is on defensive plays, especially little pops or little bloops away from the hitter where they, there's kind of like black holes down either line that the infielder has go, got to go get the ball. And in that case of that pop-up before, Edgar Renneria is another one of those great young shortstops we talk about with tremendous range. He goes halfway out to left field to catch pop-ups on a difficult play. Rockies had a glorious opportunity in the eighth. Runners on first and third, nobody out. But they could not score. Reed bounces it into right field for a base hit. McCracken heading towards third. So the tie run now on first base. And Eric Young will step to the plate. There's such a blend, Don Baylor has such a blend on his club of, of power hitters in the middle and guys that can run and put the ball in play. Walt Weiss, for example, at one end of the order can still run and puts the ball in play. Eric Young is leadoff hitter, hitting 325, had an exceptional year last year, was running for the batting title for much of the year. He can run, he can put the ball in play. Here's the pitch to Young. Inside, 1-0. Oh. Well, the Atlanta Braves are defeating the San Francisco Giants 2-0 in the seventh, so should the Braves hold on, as well as the Marlins, Atlanta's lead would remain four and a half games in the east. And Young lifts this one to right, and it drops foul. Sheffield gave chase, and the runners will retreat. Cracking back to third. Reed to first base. If that ball should drop fair out there and Gary Sheffield not get to that ball, even though Jeff Reed, the pinch hitter, and now the runner at first base is a catcher, he still would have scored on that play. That's what's difficult, too, of how to defend the hitters. That's why you use a computer that's to look for tendencies, but you cannot defend the whole field. So you, you tend to, to defend in areas where they have tendencies to hit the ball. to Young. Another base hit. One run is in. Reed stops at second. First hit of the night for Young in five at bats. And the tie run is now down at second base. The 
Now here's a pitch from Rob Nen, and you see Eric Young go the other way, and you see Nen's reaction. Oh, no, another one out there, and he's been struggling at times. He's had some difficult times trying to close games out. And I'll tell you, the closer has to be a special breed. I mean, they have got to shake things off because what happens is he knows victories for his team are riding on his shoulders. It's like a defensive back in football who gets burned for a touchdown and your team loses. When this closer comes in, he knows he's got to stop this other ball club because they have a win in their hand if he can get it done. And Rob Nen has been a very good pitcher for this club, but he has struggled recently. He retired the first batter, Castillo. He walked Manwary, retired Weiss, and now consecutive singles by the pitcher to Reed and Eric Young. Ellis Burks, who tripled his last time up. 5-4 Marlins lead now as Don Baylor hopes Burks can keep it alive. funny when you look at the Rocky lineup usually say when the game's on the line this is a guy I'd like to have up there Don Baylor can say that about five guys in that lineup and they're the next five in the batting order yeah you're not kidding you know you can believe he'd love to see Burks get on any way he can he wouldn't even mind a walk here to have Larry Walker come up the hottest man in baseball and I mean, this is incredible what he's doing. We're almost in June, and this guy's hitting well over 412 now after that last base hit. And Tony Gwynn's over 400. He's not even leading the league. Walker, perfect on-base percentage tonight. Here's the 2-0 to Burks. Ball strike one. Well, there are a lot of guys sweating down there right now for the the Marlins. Uh, there's a guy in the clubhouse all iced up, Alex Fernandez, saying, please, let's get this one for me. Jimmy Leland walking around that dugout, feeling in his stomach. Runners on first and second. Here's the pitch from Ned, and Burks drives it into left center, off the wall. One run is in. Here comes the go-ahead run, and the Rockies lead it 6-5. A two-run double with two outs in the ninth, off the bat of Ellis Burks. seen it many many times this hitting club of his you can see there's a fastball down in the strike zone Ellis Birch just hits a shot up the left center field alley and Robbie Nen the minute it left the bat he knew what was happening and now the Marlins will intentionally walk Larry Walker base for the fifth time tonight in five plate appearances. His third walk, he has also homered and singled. So Rob Mann, who came in with a 5-3 lead, looking to close things out, and came in with 33 saves in his last 37 opportunities, blows the save tonight. A no decision for Alex Fernandez, a no decision for Bobby Jones. Well, we came into this game knowing the firepower and talking about the firepower of the Rockies. There is a reason why they're leading in just about every offensive category. And again, we'll say it. It's not because of Coors Field. It's because they've got some outstanding hitters. A bunch of them. They came back from a 4-0 deficit Sunday to win 8-5. They came back from a 6-0 deficit Monday to win 9-7. They trailed today 4-0. They also trailed 5-3 with two outs in the ninth, and they now lead 6-5 as Andres Galarraga takes strike one. Burks on second with the two-run double. Walker down at first base. Strike two as Galarraga falls behind. No balls, two strikes. the order coming up for the Marlins. Here's the 0-2 and Galarraga down on strikes for the third time, but Rob Nen allows three runs at the top of the ninth as the Rockies go on 
He has a shot at him. And a pinch hit single for Luis Castillo. It's never easy. I'm telling you, I'm, I know the stomach on both these managers in each dugout. It is never easy. The toughest out to get is the last one, of course. And there's Don Bell already just saying, oh, man, here we're going again. And I think Don Bell more than anybody seen more things happen to his pitching staff, especially when you think about his pitching staff being at the bottom of the major leagues and earned run average in the last couple of seasons, and they just have gotten hammered. They're young. They can't seem to stem the tide, and here it goes again, and Greg Zahn, backup catcher, is the pinch hitter. So Castillo, the runner on first. Zahn squares to bunt. sacrifice situation. Next thing you know, he's got runners going. Castillo has already stolen 12 bases this year. He's been caught seven times. Set him in defense, but Kraken remains in the game in center. Jeff Reed, who pinch hit, is the Rockies catcher. And Steve Reed, no relation, is battery mate. Here's the 1-0 to Zahn. And he bunts it foul. Zahn came up in the Orioles system. His uncle is Rick Dempsey. Yes, who's managing in the Mets system now. And then, as you just saw, that was Jim Leland giving signs to Rich Donnelly, a third base coach. He gave a sign, and he shook his head no. What he was shaking his head no to, Donnelly was asking him with an open hand, do I give him the swing away if they charge too much? And he's saying no. I'm sure he's saying no. I want this ball bunted. Throw to first. Castillo gets back. You've got little signs. Now, sometimes a base runner will say, they'll give an open hand to the coach. Can I go? And Donnelly would then relay it to his manager, Jim Leland, saying, can I let him run? And, he, and Jimmy Leland was saying no to something. And, of course, now this is a good thing to do. If a hitter's not sure of a sign, go down and check with a third base coach and find out to make sure you're right. But I'll tell you what, I have never really figured out Jim Leland's strategy. He'll pull some things sometimes when you don't least expect it, and his guys will produce for him and execute. But we'll see what he's doing here. I would think he's trying to get this ball down. Zone perfect as a pitch hitter this year, two for two with a home run, and he punts another one foul. One ball, two strikes. Well, I'll tell you what, you put a pinch hitter up there, and normally you don't put necessarily put a pinch hitter up to bunt. But it doesn't make you very happy when they don't get it down. But as you watch now, Rich Donnelly's looking now to give the signs. 
He's got to wait till the base runner gets there and looks, which he has now. There are the signs. Young Castillo at first base looks at the first base coach. You hate to see that. You figure, I don't want him looking back over there. Might give something away, unless he does it every time. And then Greg's on. I do not think he's bunting here. I think he's trying to put this ball in play. And you might see, it would not be a hit and run necessarily with two strikes, but you might see somebody trying, uh, in a sense, Castillo trying to seal the base. Once again, to what most clubs have, you have a read on how fast the pitcher delivers the ball to the plate. And the guy who's a side wheeler usually takes more time. For an average base runner, it takes 3.5 seconds to get from first base to second. So if the pitcher takes uh, 1.3 seconds to get it to the plate, it means the catcher has got to get it down there in about two seconds, which is tough to do. Zahn wow. lays it down, and the only play is to first. He moves over. Castillo. See what I mean? You never know what Jimmy Leland's going to do. He made his young catcher bunt with two strikes on him. That, that's something. And here it is again. You'll see it. This is a tough thing to do, get a bunt down with two strikes on you already. The thing you make sure you do is get it closer to the middle of the field so it can't have a possibility of going foul. They got the job done, got the runner to second. One away. Jim Eisenreich will pinch hit for John Cangelosi. Eisenreich with a bases clearing triple in the first inning on Tuesday in the 8-5 win in Los Angeles. 38 years of age, his 14th season in the majors. Eisenreich has hit over 300 each of the last four years with Philadelphia. Castillo, the runner on second. Eisenreich fouls off the first pitch from Reed. Kenny, let me tell you something about Eisenreich. He's a good low fastball hitter. And what are you going to see from the side wheeler? You're going to see low balls down. Jim Eisenreich is, you know, as recently as last year, if you remember, had an outstanding year with the Phillies hit over 360 in 113 games. He can still hit. He runs well, but he likes the ball down in the strike zone. Hits it to the right side of the infield. Two away, and the runner, Castillo, moves over to third base. So now the Marlins down to their last out as the Rockies were in the top half of the night. Castillo, the runner on third. 6-5, Rockies lead. Edgar Renteria, one for three. Walked his last time up. Has also stolen two bases. 0-1. Now you wonder why, why would Jim Leland pinch hit for a switch hitter in Cangelosi? The reason being, Cangelosi hits 353 right-handed, but left-handed only 216. So that's why he put Eisenreich up. Now this is going to be a tough role here for the young Renteria, because from coming from the side, he's tough on right-handers. And when you come from the side you get, and you throw a breaking ball, you get a great big sweep. It's, it's a very difficult pitch for a right-hander to hit. The thing that Renneria has going for him is he does hit the ball the other way, so he might be able to get extension and push the ball out there. But a side wheel and right-hander is tough on a right-handed hitter. And Renneria bounces it to the shortstop, Weiss, and that will do it. The Colorado Rockies break their 10-game losing streak here in Miami. They come from behind to defeat the Marlins by the score of 6-5.